majestic is your name in all the earth. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the Majestic is your name in all the earth. The heavens declare your greatness, oceans cry out to you, mountains they bow down before you. So I'll join with the earth and I'll give my Join with the earth and I'll give my praise to you. Oh, oh, oh. give you our praise. Oh, and I will worship you. And I will worship.
mountains cry out to me mountains they bow down before you so i'll join with the earth and i'll give my praise to Welcome to church. We are glad you're here to worship with us and learn from God's word as Pastor Ryan speaks. 
If you missed the opportunity to connect with Psalms in the Park this past Wednesday, you have another opportunity to do so on Wednesday, August 5th at 7 p.m. Mark it on your calendar and go to westwoodchurch.bc.ca for more information. Warmer weather is finally here. We hope that you are able to enjoy summer activities with friends and family, even while we adhere to COVID practices. Bev and I have been married for 37 years, and I really appreciate her steadfastness, her trustworthiness. I know that I can always trust her to be faithful and loving, no matter what the situation is. Now, in Psalms chapter 9, verse 10, it says, Those who know your name trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. God is like that. God never changes. His love is always there. It's always steadfast. We can always know that God loves us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for this opportunity to come and praise you. We thank you that you sent Jesus so that we could be part of your family. We pray that you will help us this morning to be attentive to your word, help us to listen to what you have to say to us, and uh, bless Pastor Ryan as he speaks this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we are excited to hear from John and Bonnie Isa, missionaries we support in Thailand. Hey, uh, we're John and Bonnie Esau. We are serving in Chiang Mai, Thailand uh, as missionaries. Uh, our main role there is church planning and uh, one of the things we're most passionate about is the new form of church planning that we've taken on and that is to get behind nationals who have a vision for their own people group and want to see churches planted amongst their people. And so we've had the privilege of partnering with uh, a few really incredible uh, national leaders Thai and Kamu, which is a tribe that you'll find mostly in northern Thailand, also places like Laos and Myanmar and a whole bunch of other places. Um, and so, yeah, we, we get behind their vision and help them see uh, churches planted in their areas. Uh, we have four children, Callie, Merrick, Gavin and Tail, and we're excited to be with you this morning and just share all that God has been doing over this past three years. Yeah, we've been able to see God just faithfully enter into the lives of some leaders that um, have just received this calling and this vision that the Spirit has placed on them. And one guy that just really has blown our socks off is a guy named John. Uh, he's been an elder at his church for a lot of years, but more recently, God has just really impressed a vision to reach the lost in neighboring villages and cities. and so. He just started to really make his own personal sacrifices to go and we just committed to come alongside him and so we would send leaders with him to these various villages. He was super pumped because he started seeing people coming to Christ, responding to the gospel and he even started baptizing people. Um, the hard part for John though was when he went back to his village and was excited about this amazing kingdom fruit. Uh, he started to receive some pushback. The pastor of his church started to get upset with him and started to question his authority and started to say, you need to stop baptizing people. You need to stop leading people to Christ. Under whose authority do you have, have the right to do that? Um, and what I love about John was he said, under the authority of Christ, I do. Mm -hmm. And so we've come alongside him and continue to encourage him. Chalum and the other Kamu leaders have come alongside him and said, hey, like keep serving the kingdom, keep being faithful to our Lord and Savior, and he, he will continue to guide us and bear fruit for the kingdom. And so pray for, for guys like that, like they're making big risks and they're taking big leaps to, to see the kingdom grow um, under different sacrifices that they have to make and push back. Another guy um, that, we, that we've that we come to know is a guy named Ploy. In December, we've, we had it on our heart to get into Nan province. It's an unreached province for the Kamu in Northern Thailand. Many Kamu are there. And both Chulum and I have wanted to get into that province for years. And so as we came back uh, from Canada in November, we started praying for Nan province. We knew we didn't have enough leaders. And about four to five weeks after we were back, 
Shalom called me and said, John, are you free tomorrow? We need to go pray for a guy. I said, for who? A guy named Ploy. He's Camus. He wants to plant a church. I wrote to him and just said, hey, what have you thought about Nan Province? And he responded and said, actually, my wife and I just decided an hour ago, we are going to go back to Nan Province to plant a church in our village. And Shalom said, wow, when are you going? He said, tomorrow. We're going tomorrow. And so Shalom and I raced out to find him. We prayed for him. He just took a big leap of faith with no money, no job, enough to get on a bus and get to the village. He went. And man, it's been crazy that um, when he responds with uh, to the risk, when he responds in faith and hope that, that God has actually uh, put this vision on him and God is going to provide and God is going to use him for the glory of his kingdom, uh, God is faithful. And, and he has been. And so all the Kamu leaders in our area have all collectively said, we need to get behind this brother. We need to go visit him regularly because where he is is extremely remote. It takes me from my city about uh, eight to 12 hours, depending on which route I take and how many leaders I'm picking up. But it's very remote. It's not incredibly far. It's just really through mount mountainous regions. And and so he doesn't get a lot of people visiting him, but these leaders want to know, want him to know that he's not in it alone. Then they started to realize that he needs financial help. And three of our churches, our church plants, are stronger than the others. And so they all came together and they said, hey, like, can we together support this brother? Can we, can we sacrifice from what we have? to help him in the vision God's placed on his heart, which is a beautiful testimony of their response to what they've been seeing coming from North America, the North American church coming alongside their visions and their heart to reach the lost. And so they just naturally saw, wow, God's doing that from the North American church to us. We can be doing that as well for our own people. And so they are supporting Ploy to plant a church in his village um, really holistically and it's been beautiful. He's felt encouraged, he's felt unified in our team, and he's starting to see fruit in the last six months. Yeah, we've been so inspired to see that these people who have literally nothing um, are giving from their, their little, and it's just such a picture of what we see in scripture. Like the widow and her mites, um, we're watching our Camus brothers and sisters walk that out, and it's such a beautiful thing. So please be in prayer for them. You know, a lot of our leaders have been undergoing intense spiritual warfare over this, specifically this last year. We have just felt a whole new level of the battle that is raging on around us. Uh, we felt it as a family. We've actually come into this, um, this MENA, our ministry in North America, looking very different this time around. Uh, we've come in in ministry burnout, and so we've been a little bit off the radar if you've wondered why you haven't heard from us. Um, just trying to find rest and uh, resourcing as we um, prepare to go back to Thailand, wanting to just be ready, knowing that the battle is real and um, that we need to be armed uh, as best we can. So please just pray for us as we yeah, get, get time here in Canada. Um, we're, we're not sure when we can go back to Thailand yet due to borders being closed. Um, our kids are eager to go home and so just pray for their hearts as as they are here in Canada and it's familiar in some ways but it's it's not home for them so um, and we just ask that if you would like to partner with us in what's happening uh, we have something called the Lana project that goes um, towards all of these church plants we're spread across six provinces now and we have eight to nine churches already started and and many more plans uh, for new churches and so if you'd love to be a part of what's happening in northern thailand uh, we'd love to have you partner with us so thank you for the ways you have loved us well and supported us these last nine years uh, in thailand it has been so beautiful to know we have a huge team of people uh, working with us for god's kingdom in thailand
to your side So heaven is real and death is a lie I want to hear voices of angels above Singing as one
Come let us sing to the Lord Come let us bow down before Him His banner is love over us His mercies are new Every morning I sing sing to the Lord. Come let us bow down before Him. His banner is love over us. His mercies are new and free
praise to you today we fix our eyes and our attention on you fix our thoughts on you we declare that you are good we declare that you are holy thank you so much for who you are Thank you for the way that you reveal yourself to us in this season, God. We just want to say, God, we ask for more. Open our eyes, open our ears to hear. And God, today we just choose to glorify you. No matter what's going on around us or in us, you are worthy and we glorify you, God. In your name I pray. Well, good morning, Westwood Church. We are continuing this week in our series, Summer in the Psalms, and today we are going to be hanging out in Psalm chapter 42. And as we begin, the first couple verses of the psalm have a really interesting picture to them. And so I want to just read them quickly for you, and I want to tell you a little bit of a story that just kind of helps me visualize of the image that it's giving us. So in in verse 1, it says, As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? So in verse 1, it has this, this picture of a deer panting for water. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never personally witnessed a deer panting for water. Maybe you're in nature a lot and you, you hang out hunting and you've seen this in, in action, but for myself, I've never seen this. But one of the things I have seen is a dog panting. And lately we've been watching dog sitting this dog named Tucker, and he absolutely loves when we take him on long hikes. So me and my boys, we've been going on these long, sometimes up to 10, 15 kilometer hikes with with this dog Tucker, and, and especially if it's a hot day, he begins to pant. You know, the tongue's out, and he's like, <laughs> and he's just panting. He's longing for water. And inevitably, when we're going through the forest, we always come up to some lake or a stream, or even a mud puddle will do for him. And as soon as he sees it, he is just like running for it, and he just jumps in, and he starts lapping up the water. And there's this, there's this idea, when you, when you picture that, there's this image of, of just this idea of thirst. And when he sees that, he just, he just goes for it. He's willing to do whatever he needs to do to satisfy that thirst. And for him, it means he's perfectly comfortable drinking out of a mud puddle. But I want you to, I want you to imagine, with this whole idea of thirst in mind, I want you to imagine a time in your life when you remember being really thirsty. Maybe it was a day at the beach where you were hanging out and you just sat in the sun too long and didn't drink enough fluids and you were maybe a tad on the dehydrated side. Uh, maybe it was uh, you went out for a run and you, you didn't take a water bottle with you and by the time you got back you were really thirsty or some athletic competition or whatever the, whatever the time is in your mind that you remember being really thirsty 
I want you to think about that image. And then I want us to wrestle because the image he, he, he gives is this image of being thirsty for God's presence. He, he, he relates this idea of the deer panting and longing for water to this idea of him longing and thirsting for the presence of God. And, and when you think about that image in your mind of, of being thirsty, do you, do you thirst and long in the same way for God? And, and, and what would you be willing to do to seek the presence of God in your life, to seek out God in your life, to feel his presence, to, to hear him speak into your life? What, what, are, what, are the, what are the things you would be willing to go to? What lengths would you be willing to go to to pursue the presence of God in your life? The passage, it's, it continues then in verse 3 and 4, and he talks about how he says in verse 3, My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Now, he, the, the author of this, which, are, which were the sons of Korah, it's likely that they had been taken off uh, into captivity and they were not able to go to the temple and worship God um, with their fellow Jews. They, they didn't have that experience anymore in this season. And, and so part of what he's mourning for, part of why he's longing for, part of why he doesn't maybe necessarily sense the presence of God in the same way and longs for that is the author, one of the ways that they really sense God's presence is when they were praising God in corporate worship with others. In this case, in the temple. And, and and he, he has this picture of leading a group of people to the temple to worship God. And then this experience of corporate worship in the temple. And he longs for that experience, which when you think about it, is, is in some ways pretty applicable to where we're at right now. Some of you are maybe longing to get together on a Sunday morning and to sing worship to God together and to, to hear the, the word of God preach together in a, in a corporate setting and to just worship God. For some of you, those times when you're here on a Sunday morning, those are the times when you really, really feel God and feel his presence in a meaningful way in your life. And so maybe you, like the sons of Korah, are longing for that time when you can do that again, when you can feel God's presence in, in a corporate worship setting. Uh, maybe that's you. And, and, and as we go along, uh, I want you to notice something that the sons of Korah realized that is even more evident in our own lives. And so we'll, so we'll get there. But then, but I, before we get there, I want us to recognize that mourning and lament is a valid response to not feeling God's presence. Whatever the reason you might not feel God's presence, it may, maybe corporate worship isn't the time where you really feel God's presence. But however you feel God's presence, if you're going through a season where you don't sense his presence, it's appropriate to mourn that. It's appropriate to lament that. It's an appropriate thing to be sad about the fact that you are in a season where you're not experiencing God's presence. And we're going we're gonna to talk about kind of a strategy to work through uh, when you're in that season as we go through the passage together. But then in verse 5, so he, he kind of starts with this lament in verses 1 to 4, but then in verse 5, he changes his tune a little bit and he says, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. So what I want us to recognize here, and this is the first cycle of this, is in the passage, and, it, and many people say that Psalm 42 and 43 actually were meant to go together, so in, these, in this passage, there's actually this cycle then of lament and then hope, and then lament again, and then hope. And so the first one that we saw here is in verses 1 to 4, there's this lament of, of longing for God's presence and longing to experience God's presence 
corporately in, in temple worship. That's, that's the first main lament uh, that he speaks about. And then in verse 5, he, he goes into this expression that he's going to put his hope in God and, and, he, and he has hope that he one day is going to feel God's presence again in a meaningful way. And so he, he goes into this hope. And we're going to see in verses 6 and 7 the same idea. Verses 6 and 7, there's going to be another lament followed by hope and another lament followed by hope. And, and what I want us to recognize, yes, let's, let's have a look at what are the things he's, that the author is lamenting about, but let's also think about what are the things that give him hope? What gives him hope? In the midst of this difficult situation that he's clearly in, what is it that gives him hope? Because as we're going to see, there's also a pattern in every lament and then hope cycle. There's this idea of him, the author, talking about what the current hardship is, pouring out his heart to God about what the current hardship that he's going through is. He speaks of this. And then the next thing that he does is he remembers. And we're going to talk about the different things he remembers, but he remembers times in his life when he did feel God's presence. He remembers times when he did see God moving in significant ways. And so he goes into this cycle of remembering. And as he goes into this cycle of remembering, he then comes out of that with this idea of anticipation of what God will do. Yes, I'm in a hard time, but I remember some of the amazing things God's done in my life. And so I believe, and I'm going to hope with anticipation about the things God will one day do again. And so I want you to, to see this um, pattern that as we continue to go through. And so what I want to do now is I want to read uh, the rest of the passage, both the laments and the hope. And then we're going to talk about a few things that he remembers that help him to put his hope and trust in God, even in the midst of hardship. So verse 6 says, My God, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. So there's the lament. Then in verse 8, he says, he, he speaks of his hope again, and he says, By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to the God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, Where is your God? Why are you so downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Verse 11, here's the hope. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. So one of the first things I notice in the first cycle, the thing that he remembers is he remembers what God has done. He remembers how he felt God's presence in that corporate worship setting. So he remembers back to that time when God had done something significant in his life, when he had felt God in, in that worship moment, where he saw him work in that corporate worship setting. He remembers that, and that gives him hope that one day he's going to experience that, that opportunity. He's going to ha again have that opportunity to worship God together with others and experience God in that way that is so meaningful to him. In the second frame, he remembers he remembers who God is and that God is with us, right? Verse 8, he says this in verse 8. He says, in verse 8, he says, by day the Lord directs his love. So he remembers that God is loving and that in the day he can experience his love because God's presence is with him. And at night his song is over me. So he, he begins to recognize that even though he can't go to the temple, that God's presence is is with him both day and night. And for us, this, this has added meaning because as followers of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've decided to give your life to him and follow him, then the Holy Spirit has actually come and lives in you. Your spirit is now connected with his spirit. 
And you always are within the presence of God because the presence of God actually dwells within you. You are the temple. God's presence dwells in you. It doesn't dwell in a building anymore. It dwells in each individual that chooses to follow Jesus. And so for us, even more than the sons of Korah who wrote this psalm, we know that day and night, regardless of what situation we may find ourselves in, that day and night God's presence is with us. Whether we sense it, whether we feel it, the reality is God's presence is always with us as a follower of Jesus. And and this should give us great hope that, that God is with us no matter what we face, no matter, despite the fact that we can't meet together regularly on a Sunday morning like we might prefer. Despite all that, God's presence is with us daily, and we can daily turn to him, as the psalmist says in verse 8, in prayer. And, and so we have this opportunity to meet with God on a regular basis and experience his presence in that way. And so that, that should give us hope. And, that, and, and he remembers regularly, he talks about remembering when he did feel God's presence. So for me, uh, when I was like 17, I had this really, really incredible, profound experience with God where I just had this sensation of almost like feeling God's arms around me and, and just this sense that God really deeply loved and cared for me. And sometimes when, when God's presence seems far away, I go back and I remember that time when I felt God's presence closer than any other time possibly um, in my life. There's been other real moments where I felt his presence in a really strong, profound way. And, and in those moments, I remember, oh yeah, I, I have felt God's presence in meaningful ways. And so even in, when I'm in that season where I don't feel it as much, I remember those times when I do. And it gives me hope that I will feel his presence again. And even if, even if it's not in this life, certainly in the life to come, Although I believe and hope and trust, even in this life, I'll experience his presence um, on an ongoing basis. Then he remembers who God is in a big way. So if we look at verse 11, the thing he remembers is he says, Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him. Why? Because he's my Savior And my God, he recognizes who God is, that God is Savior. He is powerful enough to save, and he is God. He is worthy of praise. He is almighty. He is God. And so because of who he is, I can choose to place my hope in him even in the midst of hardship, even in the midst of difficult situations. And for many of us, that should give us great hope because for many of us, we have in this whole COVID season, For some of us, it's been really, really challenging times. Maybe it's been challenging for you because you're an extrovert and you haven't been able to to be around people as much as you'd like. And and so that has been a struggle. But even if you're an introvert, there's probably been times when not being as connected to people has been a challenge. How, How do we navigate that? And how do we remember to place our trust in God in the midst of that? For some of us, this season has caused financial strain and difficulty. And how do we put our trust in God when our finances are stretched to the limit? There's so many different reasons. Some of us have lost employment and we're wrestling with what, what do we do next? What, what comes next in this, in this season of life? And we, we have to remind ourselves of, of who God is and the good things he's done in our life so that we can continue to, to, to place our hope in him and to have hope in life and remember that, that it's not always going to be like this and that one day Jesus is actually going to make all things the way that they are to be and there won't be any more suffering and there won't be any more hardship. But even in this life, I put my hope in God that though there may be seasons of hardship, there are also seasons of joy and there are also seasons of feeling his presence in meaningful ways. And it's important to remember those things in times of hardship. One of the things that I have had to learn to do, because I think um, for many of us, the easy thing to do when we're, when we're feeling uncomfortable, when we're feeling anxious, when we're feeling troubled, when we're feeling 
frustrated, we want to flee from that. We want to get out of that uncomfortable space as quickly as we can. We want to avoid hardship. We want to avoid struggle. We want to avoid anything that's hard. We want a life of comfort and ease. And one of the things that I've had to learn um, going through my life is how I can sit in that uncomfortable place with God. In the midst of that current struggle, that current hardship, how do I sit in that uncomfortable place with God? Pouring out my heart, as the psalmist said um, in verse 4, even with tears. How do I sit in that place? How do I be honest with God? How do I be vulnerable with Him about where I'm at? But still, in the midst of pouring out my heart, remembering the things He has done and who He is, so I can place my hope in Him in spite of the circumstances that I'm in. Because if we're honest, the people that that really, really inspire us are not so much the people that everything just seems to, to work out for. It's the people who can walk through hardship and still put their trust in God. The people who can walk through hardship and still find joy. Those are the people that inspire us. And, and I think part of the secret of how people like that do it is they're able to sit in that uncomfortable place with God. They're able to be vulnerable and pull out, pour out their hearts to Him, but they're also able to have a heart of gratitude for remembering all that God has given them, all that they've enjoyed, all that they've experienced with God. And so they put their hope in Him that regardless of whether they feel relief from this situation in their life or not, They put their hope in God that one day, whether it's on this side of eternity or on the other, it's not going to be like this and that God cares about them and that God loves them and that God's presence is always with them. And so in bringing us full circle, I want to come back to this idea and I want you to think about if you're currently in a situation that's hard, you're going through a trial, you're going through hardship, I want you this week, to take some time to sit with God in that uncomfortable place. Sit with Him and pour out your heart to Him about how you're feeling, what you're thinking about your current hardship, the struggle that's within you. Pour that out to God. He can take it. He wants you to be vulnerable and honest and real with Him. That's how we develop a real, deep, intimate relationship with Him, is by being real about who we are and what we're feeling and what we're going through. But then, As you do that, I want you to think about times in your life where you remember, you remember, maybe it's something incredible God did in your life. Maybe it's a time where you just felt his presence in such a real, meaningful, tangible way. Whatever it is, I want you to remember who God is, what he's done in your life, so that your attitude shifts from despair to hope so that you might be able to anticipate what God will do. You might be able to anticipate feeling his presence again in a meaningful way. And so this week, if this is you, if you're going through a current hardship, I really encourage you to do this. Pour out your heart about your current hardship. Remember what God has done and who he is. And anticipate, look forward with anticipation about what God might be doing in your life. Because every hardship we go through is an opportunity for growth. It's an opportunity for God to do work on our hearts, to do work on our minds, to draw us closer to himself. But we get to make that choice. Do we choose to stay here and hang out here in despair? Or do we choose to remember who God is, what he's done, and look forward and hope in him about what he will one day do? That's my prayer for you. And I want to also encourage you, maybe this isn't you. Maybe you're not in a place where you're struggling right now. But I guarantee you that you know somebody who is. Would you join them? Would you join them in that uncomfortable place and sit with them in that pain, in that hardship? Would you sit with them? And would you, would you even, maybe if you know them well, would you maybe even reminisce with them and, and Help them remember 
in a, in, a, in a loving, gracious way. Help them remember the things God has done and maybe praise God for those things and then pray and look forward with them to anticipate what God might do in their life. Would you sit with them? Would you enter into that process with them? So those are my two challenges. If this is you, go through this. If this isn't you, find someone who you know who is and maybe sit with them in this and walk through that with them that we might carry one another's burdens with each other. With that, I want to close in prayer. Let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you so much that your presence is always with us even when we don't necessarily feel it. And Jesus, uh, for those that are going through current hardship, God, would you just give them the, the blessing of, of feeling your presence and, and, and knowing that you are with them in that season? And God, would you even stir in their hearts memories of the times when you have worked in powerful ways in their life, the times when they felt your presence the strongest? And would, would you just help them to come to a place where they remember who you are and the things you've done? And God, would they be able to place their hope in you? Help us to do that. Help us to not lose hope. Help us to not give in to despair. But help us to walk in gratitude and in anticipation of all that you have for us um, in life. And may we, may we continue to praise you, for you are our God and you are our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We